Hi, everyone. I'm Bruce Karasik, co-founder of the Jewish Republican Alliance. Thank you all for being here. We're so happy to have Daniela Bloom here with us today. We'll be speaking with Daniela in just a few minutes. But first, yesterday, November 11th, was Veterans Day. The Jewish Republican Alliance would like to extend our sincere gratitude to all those Americans who have served our country from our founding right up until today. At every big event, I always start by taking a moment to recognize and thank all the veterans in the room. And without fail, the crowd always stands and cheers to honor them. Every time I meet a veteran, I thank them for their service, and you should too. This past week, I watched an excellent documentary on, it's, it's about George Washington. It was on Amazon Prime, and it's called The First American, and it, the executive producers are Newt and Callista Gingrich. So during the show, they talk, one historian talks about it, and he says, if you asked all the prominent founders, Franklin, Madison, Jefferson, Adams, Hamilton, they all said the same thing, that Washington is the greatest of us all. In essence, there never would have been a United States of America without George Washington. But the movie opens with the words, they pledged their lives, their fortunes, and their sacred honor. If they lost, most would likely be jailed or hanged. They were taking on the greatest fighting force in history without, without any type of, of Navy, and they had an amateur army. The founding of America was nothing short of a miracle, and the sacrifices and bravery displayed by our founders and all those who have fought for freedom, liberty, and our independence should be forever honored and cherished. Those who live here now owe a great debt of debt gratitude to all the heroes who have come before us. Abraham Lincoln said America is the last best hope of earth. And Thomas Paine said the cause of America is in a great measure the cause of all mankind. But Benjamin Franklin warned us wisely when he said those who would give up essential liberty to purchase a little temporary safety deserve neither liberty nor safety. And today our freedoms and our liberties are under attack not by an outside government or by the King of England, but rather it is coming from our own government. Whether, whenever a conservative or any American is censored, it is a violation of the right of free speech for all of us. Whenever a doctor, a nurse, a police officer, or a teacher is fired for not taking a vaccine or for exercising their right to free speech, it is an attack upon all of our freedoms and all those who have fought to preserve them. When Joe Biden opens up borders to illegal aliens, does not test them, does not vaccinate them, and then secretly flies them to all parts of our country, it is an attack on freedom for all American citizens and those immigrants who obey the laws. When Joe Biden shuts down the American oil pipelines and then encourages OPEC to produce more oil, he is infringing on the freedoms of American energy companies. When rioters are allowed to burn, loot, and commit acts of violence, the freedoms of law-abiding citizens are being denied. When Governor Newsom, the governor of California, frees thousands of prisoners, and the result is crime increases to record levels. It endangers the freedoms of good Americans and their right to liberty, life, and the pursuit of happiness. And when an inept commander in chief leaves Americans behind with billions of dollars of equipment in Afghanistan, and then he entrusts the enemies to provide security for our troops and our people, and it results in the slaughter of 13 servicemen who did not have to die. It is a betrayal to them and all the veterans who have served our country. And when Americans who have served our country are given dishonorable discharges, lose their right to vote, lose their VA benefits and retirement for refusing vaccines, it is a shameful travesty and an overreaching attack on our veterans. In closing, Ronald Reagan once said, we the people 
We, the people, tell the government what to do. It doesn't tell us. Almost all the world's constitutions are documents where governments tell the people what their privileges are. Our constitution is a document where we, the people, tell the government what it is allowed to do. We, the people, are free. So I want to thank you all for being here. And now I'd like to introduce to you my good friend and fellow JRA co-founder, Mitch Silberman. Mitch. Hello, JRA community. It is always so great when we are together. There's an old saying that all of you know, very wise, very well known, you could say it with me, which is if you're not a liberal when you're 25, you have no heart. If you're not a conservative by the time you're 35, you have no brain. Well, we are blessed today with a guest that has a heart and a brain. And I'm always encouraged when I meet with younger people who are conservative, because as you know, there aren't enough young conservatives out there. But I'm starting to think that deep down, young people probably are conservative. They just don't know it. They have literally been hit with an avalanche of leftism from their parents or their, rather their friends, entertainment, social media, sports, politics. They are so filled with all this nonsense that just isn't so, that doesn't make sense, that they don't even know they are conservative. But there's a solution to that. You unleash the power of questions. You ask them great questions that impact them, that affect them, and here's the key. If you say it, they doubt it. But if they say it, it's true. It's just the way our brain works. So I'll give you kind of a fun example. As many of you know, I was a child actor. And because of that, along with the fact that I now have clients in the entertainment industry, I was a member of an underground group of Hollywood conservatives. These were actors, writers, producers, directors, stuntmen who all made their living in Hollywood. They passionately love America, had steadfast support for Israel, but of course couldn't come out of the closet. And I met some amazing patriots there, some famous, some not so famous. But I happened to strike up a friendship with a gentleman named Ira. And we decided to cut a short video together. And he, he directed it, we wrote it together. We had his young son, Sam, who was about 10 years old, play my son in, in the video. And Ira, I hope you're watching right now. So it went something like this. I'm sitting at the kitchen table and I'm paying the bills. And then Ira yells, action. And as an adult, it felt good to hear that again. I haven't heard that in a while. So Sam walks up to me and he says, Dad, I got an A in geometry. I said, that's wonderful. I am so proud of you. How'd your best friend Timmy do? And he said, oh, Timmy failed. He, he got an F. And I said, well, I know how important grade redistribution is and equity. So here's the solution. You and Timmy go to the teacher and say, hey, I have an F. I have an A. He has an F. Why don't we split the difference so we both get a C? Of course, Sam didn't like this. He said, what? That's not fair. I worked so hard for that grade. I studied. I did all my homework. I stayed up late. Timmy didn't do anything. He goofed off. He played video games. He didn't even attend class. Why should I give him half my grade? So I smiled, put my hand on his shoulder and said, son, welcome to the Republican Party. And of course, I could have easily have said, welcome to conservatism or actually welcome to real life. So if you ask them questions like this, you get them to think. They're not going to say, oh, my goodness, I'm really a conservative. But you start to penetrate that claptrap they're being dealt. How about this? You have a child who earns $25 a week doing chores around the house. And you say, you know what? Um, I know we agreed you're going to earn $25 a week for the chores. But uh, after taxes, you're going to get 20. They're going to say, well, what do you mean? You say, well, that's how the real life works. I go out and work. The government takes its fair share of my money, gives me the rest. So you're going to get 20 from now on. How do you think that's going to go over? I have one better. You can ask them, are they teaching you how wonderful communism and socialism is in school? Yeah. Okay. So here's what we're going to do. You're going to continue to do your chores and forget the $20. We're going to give the entire $25 to your brother who does no chores. So you do the work. He gets the money. So you start to talk about this, like the overrepresentation of black athletes in sports, or the fact, as Bruce mentioned, that Americans are required to show proof of vaccination, but not illegal aliens. So start to ask them questions and let them answer, and you just have to do it. That's how you get through to them. And I'm going to leave you with a great quote I heard from, of all people, J.K. Rowling. She's one of the wealthiest people in the world. I think she's the richest woman in the world, other than the Queen of England. And you know her as the creator of Harry Potter. And she is certainly no Republican, but she said this, it takes a great deal of bravery to stand up to our enemies, but just as much to stand up to our friends.
Now, she didn't say argue, belittle, or bicker, but stand up to your friends. Let them know you're conservative. Come out of the closet. Show them who you are, that you're a good, decent, wonderful person who is leading by example as a conservative. And now I get the great pleasure of introducing Daniela Bloom. She is America's premier relationship and dating authority, goes underneath the headlines to bridge the gap between what's going on in our personal relationships today and what's going on in our nation and world at large. Daniela, like me, is a former liberal and founder of Free Arts, the free thinkers advocate of Hollywood in Hollywood. Daniela's candid, comedic, and no-nonsense approach to dating, relationships, and now politics brings a fresh view to audiences around the world. She's a frequent guest on TV and radio shows, as well as a successful keynote speaker. Daniela has been on stage with the Larry Elder campaign, guest starring Good Morning in L.A., La La Land, uh, on air with Ryan Seacrest, The John and Ken Show, NBC Nightly News, Fox and Friends, Huffington Post, and even endorsed by Dennis Prager. A mom of three, she's also the number one best-selling author of the multi-award-winning Undertree children's series that reminds readers of all ages on Judeo-Christian universalist lessons on love and life. Welcome, Daniela. It is certainly a pleasure to be here, Mitch and Bruce. I, um, I discovered you guys a while back when uh, Ben Shapiro was in town and I was uh, you know, shedding my liberal layers and becoming a patriot, uh, standing up for our freedom, standing up for our country. I've loved your Zoom calls, and it is now an honor to be on the other side. <laughs> well, it's it's our honor to have you on, Daniela. You know, I've mentioned to a few people we, uh, that you were coming on, and I said, Daniela is such a great connector. She's an up and coming person that's going to really be heard. She's almost like to me, like the uh, Jewish Candace Owens, like just is going to be out there, and everyone will know who you are. But why don't you tell the audience a little bit about your background and, and why you're here? Sure. I mean, uh, it certainly has become front and center in my life. Living in Los Angeles, it's not for the faint of heart. If we haven't moved to Florida and we're still here, then we are the, uh, the frontline uh, warriors in terms of fighting for our freedoms. Because if we do not swim strong, we will drown. And uh, that has definitely become apparent to me as a psychotherapist, as I've seen firsthand, the many reasons why our relationships are falling apart today mirror the reasons why our country is falling apart today. The gaslighting, if only you would change, the hypocrisy, the double standards. And it's just, especially as a mother of three who had gotten tired of fighting the tyranny of the teachers unions and finally took all three kids out of LAUSD into private school. I feel as a psychotherapist, fundamentally, if my clients are not free to get back to their full potential in love and life, how can our country reach its full potential when basic freedoms are at question? So Daniela, was there a pivotal moment that transformed you from a liberal to a current free thinker? Yes, actually there was a few and they kind of happened around the same time. So I am a pro-Israel advocate. Um, I'm half Israeli. I've studied in Israel. I have tons of family in Israel. So understanding the propaganda from the Palestinian plight of victimhood was very familiar to me. So when I saw this happening in our own country with the BLM movement and the Women's March and the skewing of facts and narrative, I started to pay more attention to that. But actually, Mitch, going through my own divorce and understanding that when you are in family court, which is really nothing to do with the family, uh, it's really about parental rights, not about the interests of the children. It's really a win or lose scenario. So when you're dealing with um, someone in court and you are the party of compromise and willing to put the best interest first and you're willing to just negotiate and you're dealing with a party that's angry and no matter what you do, it doesn't matter because they are empowered by their victimhood. I had a light bulb moment 
Like this is the same thing we're seeing in our politics. We say the same thing with the Palestinians. It's not about land. It's not like you give the Palestinians the land they want. They're gonna just say, you know what? Now we can love each other. Now we can love you. Um, same thing with BLM, any amount of reparations, any, any amount of acknowledgement of the systemic racism, are, is, is it gonna internally shift the inside story of wait, what am I gonna do with all this anger? Now what? So that idea of personal responsibility at the end of the day is what really propelled me into free thinking. Oh, well, that, that's really a great story. Um, you know, with the Virginia, recent Virginia governor's race, uh -huh. one of the, the key issues that the reporters talked about were the strength of the moms who were really upset about the way education was taking place in, in our schools. Um, as a mom, how did you feel about watching, you know, the whole CRT thing and, and the moms taking an activist role and then only to be threatened by the attorney general. How did that sit with you and how did that make you feel? First of all, I mean, the results of Virginia, I wish those were the same results in California, but that was a pivotal moment um, for me and I think many Americans where so many parents in Virginia ignored the mainstream media, mainstream media narratives of CRT is nothing and crime is fine and blah, blah, blah. And they went to the streets, they went to the school board. I told my daughter I have a call and she still, um, um, they went to the streets, they went to the school board and they stood up for their children and they stood up for what's right in this country. And that's happening in New Jersey, it's happening in California, we've had some wins. And at the end of the day, that's what we the people is all about. This is how we're gonna steer the battleship of our country in the right direction. You know, um, <clears throat> Danielle, I mentioned in the pre-show, uh, all one of our favorites, I know yours, Bruce, and mine is Dennis Prager. And uh, oftentimes when he takes a call, they'll say, hi, Dennis, how are you? And he says, I'm fine, my country isn't. Yeah. But, you know, how would you, how would you ca um, counsel people, our viewers today to, how can they stay strong and resilient as individuals when so much is going wrong in our nation? Great question. And I'm always about empowerment and action steps. To be honest, there is, it's like the Titanic is sinking, but the free thinkers are dancing on the rooftop with life jackets. And the reason is because when you find another free thinker in LA, even someone who's knocking on the door with solar and they drop a term and you're like, wait, are you, wait, are you, are you, are you, are you a supporter? Are you a patriot? Or do you do love the country? You're instantly bonded. So the community and the people I have met here in Los Angeles gives me energy to keep going. So I would recommend absolutely finding your tribe. In fact, I have so much more abundance of Christian friends and friends from all different minorities, all different backgrounds than I've ever had before, because we're instantly bonded. Now you could say it's a trauma bond. <laughs> we're instantly bonded by our trauma of Los Angeles, but it's a real bond and I've made amazing friendships. So number one, it's finding your own tribe, finding your own community. Number two, it's strengthening your boundaries not wasting your energy on people who are just not receptive. You know, cognitive dissidence is a real thing. They've actually done brain imaging. When someone is given so much information that is, it is completely irrefutable and it can rock all of the foundation that they're standing on, the brain just goes into denial. <laughs> because it's a painful sensation to take it in. It's a physically painful sensation. So not to waste your breath on people who are not receptive, but the people who are waking up, focusing on that, focusing on inspiring others, leading by example, and it's okay to be unapologetic. I just saw a headline today of the job losses in August and September and all the reasons why interesting to me how not one of them not one of these headlines has mentioned the mandates <laughs> it's like um gaslighting at its finest it's you know we see with the Kyle Rittenhouse case pay no attention 
to the man behind the curtain. I call it like the, the Wizard of Oz phenomenon. We see this almost daily with mainstream media. You know, I want to chime in on Mitch's question about how people can stay strong. You know, I think we, we at the Jewish Republican Alliance take real pride in having strong guests like yourself who are resilient and strong and set a tone of, of leadership in our country, in our local politics and in our community. And it's interesting, I saw uh, online a convention of Democrat socialists and I compare them because it was so, it was almost funny because I compare them to what the sacrifices were by our founding fathers, by the people who served in our military, walking through snow with no shoes and no food and no equipment. And these people are in this convention and they can't clap because people may have sensory overload. So they raise their hands to show they're clapping or they said they have safe rooms for people to process what is going on. Since you're a psychotherapist, what is the psychology of people today that has why have they gotten so less tough, so less resilient? And what can be done about that? Yeah, I mean, I feel like in general, the pendulum tends to swing one way and then it goes and swings the other. And, you know, we're coming from generations where kids were, you know, to be seen and not heard. And now we're in this generation of, you know, permissiveness and you know, time, no timeouts and, you know, child-centered. It's become parent-centered to child-centered and both extremes are, are, are not good. We always need a balance. Our religion preaches balance. Everything that is beneficial is about balance. In general, what I'm finding, especially with the left, is this compulsive desire to control all external forces so they're comfortable. And that's just not possible. The idea of resilience, of be okay anyway, is what has been missing a lot with children today. People are so entitled to complaining. It's like um, the, the loudest tantrum you have, the more power you have. So we definitely have a problem here. You know, Daniela, I want to drill down deeper on something you said before, which is really, I agree with. You know, the viewers today, they're, they're on our side. They are our tribe. I love what you said, find your tribe. It's so empowering and it, and it, it works. Um, then you have the other extreme, which you said, don't bother. I, and I agree with that as well. But there's a certain group of people in the middle that just befuddles me. And I'm curious of your take. All of us in our lives have good, decent, wonderful people by all measures. They, they are great contributors to society. They contribute to charity. They're employers. Um, they're wonderful people and they can, and they're informed, maybe not our sources, but they do read the news, right? The fake news, but they continue to support, for lack of a better term, evil and destruction. Mm -hmm. Those are the people that drive me crazy because I'm like, how do we get through to them? Yes. Um, you know, at the end of the day, people think they're doing something good or they won't be doing it. You know, they think they're supporting the underdog. They think that, and again, it's something that they likely identify with in their own personal lives, that they can relate to that sense of powerlessness, the sense of not feeling a sense of belonging or validated. So a lot of the times it is a projection. So it's really important. I do believe fundamentally that we as human beings do have the same universal needs and wants but our strategies to go about them and our priorities in terms of what matters the most are really what tend to be at odds. That's, that's very, very true. And one of the things that has troubled me, and I, and I talked about it in our speech, but the, the removal of freedoms that we have taken for granted living in America, it, it, United States was a, beacon of hope, people fighting to get in here, not just because of the economic opportunities, but for freedom. And there's example after example. Uh, there's one where this Lieutenant Colonel Scheller was a US Marine Lieutenant and he spoke out against 
what was going on in Afghanistan and how he criticized his superior officers for their negligence. And he was thrown into solitary confinement mm -hmm. without any, any hearing or anything like that. Are you noticing the same things that I'm noticing that we're seeing the destruction of ordinary freedoms in the United States? It's horrible. I mean, if I see one more freaking headline about January 6th, I think I'm going to vomit. And the real victims are these people who've been arrested, who went there, not because they're domestic terrorists, but because they love our country. It was attended by tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, with no incidences for the most part. And the fact that they're thrown in jail and forgotten about, often in solitary confinement, with no prior criminal records, how is this America? How is this America? And, you know, it's crazy. I was at a rally with my daughter yesterday. We were honoring the veterans for the very freedoms they fought for that so many people are just blindly taking for granted and, and we're losing. And um, we were all out there without our masks and with our signs and uh, this, this, um, this gentleman came with his opaque black mask on and he wanted to know why we're there and just having a conversation with him about we are not anti-vast, we're just anti-mandate and we, we want our children to have a right to education and to work without, with, with, and be able to still mitigate our own risks and our informed consent. And he, all he was stuck on was, but the community, don't you want everyone safe? It was that cognitive dissonance again. And I'm like, I feel like I, this, this is not the America I grew up in. But, you know, sometimes they say the darkest hour is before dawn, and I do think people are waking up. I think you're reading my mind, Daniela. That's a perfect segue to my next question for you. I want you to look deep into your crystal ball. Yes. With the waking up that you, you see going on. If we're having this meeting again a year from now, what's going on in the U.S.? Not the elections. That's a year from now. We, we all we hope for a bloodbath on their side and that we win big. That's fine. But what do you see in terms of culture and people and freedoms and our society in the next 12 months or so? It's a fantastic question. Thank you, Mitch. Uh, I'm around a lot of movers and shakers. And that is kind of why I came. Um, I said, you know, we don't have the luxury to sit by and lose the culture war. It's affecting our education. It's affecting our entertainment especially after working with the Larry Elder campaign. And he was marketed as the black face of white supremacy instead of American success story from South Central Hollywood, we have a problem. And I FOA, the group that you were a part of, I said, you know what, I know one's doing something, I'm, I'm gonna take the reins. I'm gonna do something about it, but I'm gonna have a different spin. I wasn't involved with FOA back then because I was still a liberal. I know, joke's on me. Um, but I've, 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 I'm, I've, I'm, I'm awakened now and we do have to rebrand and it starts with Hollywood and it's rebranding. We have to stay away from words like Republican, conservative, Trump supporter, because Trump deranged syndrome is a real thing. <laughs> try it sometime just <laughs> shout out trump and watch the like total panic and like pavlovian reaction but anyway free thinker though still seems to be a cool term and if we can bring people together on the idea of personal sovereignty and and the ability to be free to create because how can you truly create as an artist if you are worried about mandates and censorship and cancel culture so the group I have spearheaded, which is taking off, I am so happy to report, it's completely vetted, it's completely word of mouth, it's for free thinkers in the industry. We have grown leaps and bounds in the last several weeks. But eventually when this group gets out, we do want the Nicki Minaj's, the Joe Rogan's, the Bill Mars of the world to be ambassadors because free thinking doesn't have to have a partisan label because what is free thinking? It's critical thinking, it's common sense thinking, it's accountability thinking. 
That is so true. Well, I, I, I've heard great things about your group, Free Arts, and uh, everybody should know about it if they're in the industry and, and get involved. Okay, so, you know, Mitch and I are not in the dating world, obviously, <laughs> uh, but so many of the people in our audience, you know, our kids are all in the dating world. So yeah. that is one of your, your many expertise. So w- tell the audience, what do you think the most common mistakes that men and women are making in the dating world today? It is my favorite subject. Um, I do work with the concept of law of attraction. So truly, once you get clear and in alignment, which you want to call in, it is not a matter of if, it's a matter of when. But where the struggle comes from is people think they're clear and they really aren't. For example, when you send mixed messages out to the universe or to God or to Hashem or to Jesus, whoever you want to call the greater force, you neutralize, you neutralize the attraction. For example, if you're like, oh, I'm so ready to get married, but your longest relationship has been six months and you know, you're, 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 you're 38 years old, you know, we, we, let's, let's get into that. Are you, do, do you really want to get married? Because it sounds like if you did, your life would have taken on a different role. What, what are you afraid of? What is under that, that got you here? You know, and you, you have a horrible breakup. You know, I just want to meet the one, but you still think everyone ultimately cheats, right? So you, you, you neutralize your charge and you end up attracting the very patterns and relationships you want to avoid. So What I would say to people today, you have to get clear on what you truly do want, not what you should want, not what your people, your your family thinks you, where where you should be, what you truly want. And you start from there and dating, if you're going to do it well, and it's going to succeed into a long-term partnership, it has to be fun again. It should not feel like an interview. There should not be fear if you have those things happening to you, you're not date ready. Let's get you date ready because dating, especially successfully, especially after a breakup or if you haven't had luck, like if you've become a professional dater for the last 20 years and you're just jaded and you think everyone lies, we have to make it fun and exciting again because that's how you show up and you get only one swipe to make a first impression. And then you only, you know, especially today, online dating is the dating of front and center way of connecting, especially because of quarantine and how people choose pictures, how people describe themselves or lack thereof. There's tons of subliminal messages just right there. And many people can be very successful in many areas of their lives. But when it comes to dating, they end up falling all over themselves. They have good intention, but they're making basic, basic mistakes. For example, Men and women are attracted to very different things. Men are visual, so women do need to have clear pictures. But both men and women, the first picture should always be looking straight at the camera and smiling. I mean, that you would think that's common sense. You would, couldn't believe how many things or anything but that first picture. I mean, I'm talking about cars and babies and dogs and what other things, but always the first picture should be front and center, looking at the camera with good lighting. Um, but for women, women want to see men in suits, okay, or collared shirts, something that conveys I have a job. Don't show gym pictures, okay? <laughs> Hello, we don't need to see that. You want to see that of us. We don't need to see that of you. With women, yes, we know men are visual, but if you present yourself as, 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 as too promiscuous in your pictures, he's going to feel that's how you are with every guy. Show some class, show your full figure, but do it elegantly. Everything counts. Every decision you make has a subliminal message attached to it. Very fascinating to me. I'll be cel- Stephanie and I will be celebrating our 24th wedding anniversary uh, in a couple of weeks, but this is so fascinating. You know, <laughs> one of the to me, one of the greatest evils of this whole uh, response has been the lockdown, yeah. you know, and it's not the pandemic, it's not the virus with the 99% survival, it's the lockdown. How are young, young single people, and maybe in our case, conservative, how are they supposed to 
get to know each other or trust or interact other than what you called swiping because now the, you're you're literally isolating people and i think it creates more fears and and strange emotions than ever before yes uh i've gotten that question very often especially today you know it used to be i i want to you know it's so important to me to to date Jewish. <laughs> now it's so important to me to date conservative because you don't know what you're getting when you're just getting Jewish today. Um, so what for me is, if it's clear for you that this is a core value, that is what you lead with. You should not be afraid to put people off because that is how you attract what you want. When I was dating in quarantine a year, year and a half ago, I put my Trump hat on front and center make America great again, right there. And I also used emojis very strategically with my American flag and my Israeli flag. So if you, you're gonna either love it or not, and that's easier for me. So I tell people all the time, if it's clear for you, and also ladies in LA and maybe other cities, when men find a woman with conservative mindset, it's like a diamond in the raw. Just go with that knowledge. Great advice. You know, I would think it would be harder knowing the, the women I do that are in their 30s and they're out there dating, that it would be harder to have a relationship with someone if you're a conservative, with someone who was a leftist or a liberal, than someone who is from a different religion. It presents a whole different set of you know, situations but, and complications, but I would think because people, 50% of the country agrees on almost nothing with the other 50% <laughs> of the country. So I would think it would have to be a very important uh, point to, to choose on who you're gonna be with. Unfortunately, it's become, it's never been like this before. It's very, you know, it, it, when I it, when I was much younger in the '90s and I was in college, it was not that big a deal. And also, de the, to be a, a Democrat back then was not like it is today. There was this no woke socialist. It was more moderate. It was a more moderate um, mentality. But the because we are in parallel realities, because we see completely different pain points. You know, you have the audience of everything is racist and everything is about climate change no matter where you start by the way <laughs> the headline it always ends there and then you have the other audience of like everything else you know the inflation the border crisis afghanistan crt so when you don't have that in common today you really care about completely different worlds and that's going to affect how you see the world and how you go forward with how you would approach child rearing and 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 just your perspective in life, because we have this idea of vic empowered victimhood and personal responsibility. So if you're, if you're with someone who completely identifies solely with the victim, it's going to be very hard. It's going to be very hard for you to find common ground. You know, we have so many great questions in the audience. That last one was from, uh... A very famous person called anonymous but this one is from ed s and ed's asking you as a psychotherapist how can one deal with the feeling of being punched in the gut when our fellow jews like schumer and nadler and schiff among others show absolute leftism in their words and actions it is a very real question i experienced that exact physical sensation when we were dealing with the uh the school board members of LAUSD. We were at a unanimous finish line to pass the vote and leave it to the one culturally Jewish board member to come in and at the last second say, you know what? I think we need to have J Street on the team of experts mm -hmm. who decide what anti Semitism is. Leave it to the Jew. And yes, it felt like such a gut punch because everyone was in alignment. The Latinos, the, G the Asians, the Christians, everyone was in alignment, but leave it to the cultural unaffiliated Jew to um, muck things up. So I totally get that sentiment. 
when we are triggered, it does give us a pause to reflect and say, okay, obviously this was not personal. I don't know them personally, but what is coming up for me? And betrayal is a real thing. It does feel like a betrayal, especially since we have our own family members who've survived the Holocaust, who've survived the exodus from the Middle East to Israel. We know firsthand accounts of what it's not like to really be free. And yet we have these very Jews funding, like Newsom's campaign was funded mostly by liberal Jews. What is happening? Um, it is very frustrating. What I take solace in is I, I align back with my tribe and I get so much great support from our Christian friends today. And together we can just laugh at the people and we pray for them that they start to wake up because we can't spend energy on what we can't control. We can only lead by example. That is a great quote and great advice, obviously. You know, one of the big topics of today is the vaccine and the vaccine mandate. Um, I am fully vaccinated, but I am completely against vaccine mandates. And we have a question from David P. And he says, Daniela, based on what you have, what you have seen and know, what is your view with the current vaccine mandates and the impact on relationships, jobs, and industries? It's horrible. This is why I, uh, together with a bunch of other moms, made a huge movement. We did the United We Stand rally against medical apartheid, medical segregation, and standing for medical freedoms. Uh, it's, um, it's, it's, it's really tough. It's really tough because the vaccine has come to symbolize so much more than health. First of all, we all know it's not about public health because if it was, we would be focused on mental health, especially for children as the um, American Pediatric, uh, AAP, American Academy of Pediatrics has declared a national emergency amongst children and adults as suicide as the second leading cause of death in children. So the COVID vaccine for children, it's not about health. So that's it's very tough because what else the vaccine has come to civilize is, is, is the vilifying of people who choose not to get it. And we've seen this happen in our history before. It's tough because it's very hard to be able to go underneath that. People, just like with Trump deranged syndrome, if they see that you're not vaccinated, it's like, warning, warning, domestic terrorist, warning, it's because of you, we still have COVID. Warning, I mean, it's just, it's like this knee jerk reaction. But if you know, you watch CNN all day long, that's, that's what you get. That's, that's true systemic brainwashing. We have a systemic problem. It's the media brainwashing. Um, again, I don't feel it as much because I surround myself with like-minded people this week in the mandates. We, we get to discover together which restaurants are, um, more free thinking and which ones are not and we will just support the free thinkers that is the difference we're not going to just sit and complain about it we are going to find another way we're going to find another business we're going to find another we're going to open a hollywood studio in filmar like we're going to just keep going and that is the difference yeah that's um you know you bring up so many uh, amazing points you know, our, our generation was brought up with freedom. Bruce has always gave a beautiful speech about freedom and it was ingrained in us. Um, the younger generation, I, they don't understand the history and our freedoms. So I'm gonna delve a little deeper into this vaccine mandate. So a young person says to you, um, I don't understand. Don't you want everyone to be safe? Isn't that isn't the most important thing? Which to me, the nonsensical logic is, you want the unvaccinated to get vaccinated to protect the vaccinated against the virus they're vaccinated against. Got it. So forgetting the irrationality of it, yeah. I'm talking about freedom versus, no, 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 freedom is secondary or down the road because there's nothing more important than the God of health or the, as you put, the God of community. Yeah. Well, Dennis Prager made a, said an excellent, uh, spoke to that perfectly. He said, seeing someone 
walking, run, jogging, jogging down the street with two masks by themselves outside in blind compliance, because those are the heroes today, is way more terrifying than COVID. We have lost our mark here. We've lost our mark. And there was an amazing video by JP Spears who encapsulated this beautifully. He compares it to a, wearing a life jacket in a pool, like why you have to wear a life jacket for other people, but you you have, you have you can swim, but you still need a life jacket. Like it's genius. So if you haven't seen it, go check it out. But it that's just it. It's 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 no longer logical. It's no longer about the science. I mean, it's amazing, you know, the, the antibodies, ironically, the antibody studies that it's come out of Israel, uh, which is heavily vaccinated in itself, but saying that natural antibodies are 27 times more effective than vaccines that we see need a constant booster, how that has not translated here, how that has not been given an option where you can prove that you've had COVID, why that's not even in the in the discussion is insane so that you can tell that's why people are so mistrusting this is why it feels so political this is why it feels about control over our freedoms as opposed to public safety it's a, a very good point one of the things obviously with the jewish republican alliance and now forming jra nation you know our plan is to really be involved with uh, midterm elections in 2022, help local and national candidates, um, and also in 2024 uh, for the presidential election and the, and the other congressional elections. But what has happened is, is that, especially in California and, and in other places, the pandemic has caused uh, a knee-jerk reaction amongst people on the left to have mail-in ballots that are that you cannot document who these people are and claiming that you know I, I bring this up almost every week but claiming you know that you can't have signature verification because it's it's racist to have signature verification and we can ballot harvest and we can dump all these ballots in virginia they had voting at the polls it wasn't exclusively mail-in ballots so what are your thoughts on how we can pressure our leaders to bring us back to be able to vote at the polls and verify that everybody votes, but only legal votes count. Oh, it is so frustrating that you need an ID to fix your cell phone. You need an ID to get a COVID test, but God forbid you're asked for an ID to decide and determine the leaders of the free world. I actually lived in Virginia for 11 years. Um, I had the audacity of hope to vote for Obama twice in Virginia, um, I will admit. And I'm so happy it's turned red again. But when I was in Virginia, I did vote with my voter ID. And I do think that makes a huge difference. I do think voting in person makes a huge difference. Virginia is also very military orientated. Uh, Newsom has, I think, if I'm not mistaken, universalized mail-in voting. I mean, it basically has, he has basically, by that notion and also ballot harvesting being legal, I don't think right now, until that changes, we have a shot at a conservative governor. What we can best hope for is a moderate Democrat but I don't want that to be discouraging because again, we the people always rises and so many of us, so many of my friends and colleagues are running for school board or running for LA County um, or city members, um, uh, um, city council. Um, people are getting involved and that's how we turn the tide. But if our elections are unfair and if our elections are not documented, I think that has to be fixed yeah. So we can really, you know, it, it seems to always to be the case that we have an election and the Republican takes a big lead and all of a sudden these mail-in ballots pour in and then you don't know who's going to win and you go to sleep saying, what just happened? I mean, that's what happened in the last two years. COVID allowed for a lot of loopholes. There was a reason, that was, that was many of the reasons why the state Supreme Courts won't even 
look at these legitimate cases uh, because of COVID, everything's COVID. I do think it's a huge problem. We should all want election integrity. We should all as Americans want to be able to sleep at night that if the other guy ran a fair campaign and won, okay, we got to do better next time. Who wants to feel duped? And yes, there's about 80 million Americans who are still very angry, who are still very jaded by the mainstream media and Hollywood, who want a landing place. Very true. You know, Daniela, we have kind of a, a gut-wrenching question from Patty D, and I'm sure she's not alone in this kind of a situation. She writes, hi, Daniela, I have had a really tough two years because my boyfriend that I live with and my oldest son are Democrats. What's your advice to her? Because it's a very tough situation. And I think we all have family members that, uh, you know, this is something that we all have to try to deal with. Not only is it tough today, but I mean, to, to look at your own family members as the problem the pro because of you and I have to live with you. Not only do I hate your lasagna, but you are the reason our country is a disaster. I mean, it is just really high stakes today really high stakes and it's really tough especially with kids because you know for example blm like mom what what's wrong with blm i mean look i have three kids of my own i you know my middle daughter is my patriot zionist she comes to all the rallies with me but my eldest daughter man she goes to me so mom what, what are your pronouns you know she <laughs> so yeah it's starting i mean you know i I joke that like you go to the doctor's office and they give you this list of like pre-existing conditions to watch for. There should be a section on like pre, you know, precondition to be a liberal because we have to watch for that. Um, so it's tough. It's tough when it's in your own family. And especially if they want a reaction, you know, I would really try to stay grounded as possible. And it's not about winning an argument because you're not going to. It's about asking questions and engaging and just opening a dialogue. Like, like, uh, like you were saying, Mitch, with the videos you were doing, you know, it's like, what would you do in this situation? What do you think is fair? And then you, you get them to buy in to that dialogue. And, um, and that same daughter who asked me about my pronouns, she also says, I can't stand the homeless. So I'm not worried about her. I think she'll get back on track, but, um, there actually is a great book by my friend Will Witt from PragerU. I don't think I'm gonna, I'm saying, because it's all perfectly right, but it's like how to win liberals and win arguments. It was based off like how to win friends, influence people. And I, I have my own copy and he, you know, that's what he does all day long is he goes to college campuses and he's just not confrontational. He's respectful and he gets people to like, huh wait, you're, you're actually a lot more intelligent and you're making a lot of sense here. Either I'm wrong and you're right or what, what's happening right now? And he does it in a very effective way. So I would recommend getting that book. Don't try to win arguments, just ask more questions. So you, you mentioned, Daniela, in your answer just now, uh, the homeless. And I look out at our society now and we're calling a group of people who are usually not well physically, not well mentally, maybe on drugs, and we're calling them homeless. And it's a group that's being ignored because they're really not homeless. Because if you gave some of these people on the street a brand new mansion in Beverly Hills, they wouldn't be fine. Right. So I don't know what's happened when you talk about helping people who are less fortunate, but you can't ride along the beach, you can't walk into a city, you can't walk anywhere without seeing poor people who just need help. Yeah. How can we fix that? It's, it's terrible. You know, I, I ask even my own clients when they're perpetuating their own crisis, I said, what will it take? When will enough be enough? I mean, we live in a suburb of the valley. And you know it's a it's a it's a comfortable, affluent neighborhood, and there's tons of tents in front of Panera and Ralph's. And I'm like, does does someone have to come out who's mentally deranged with a syringe and stab a child, for for this to become a problem? Like, when will enough be enough? And like what we were saying before, yes, it's not just giving them a home. 
There is a reason why I think half of the homeless population in America is in California because they have permissive laws. They have rights that they don't have in other places. Um, and I think this was a PragerU video who pointed to the fact that you go to LA and there's tons of homeless in Venice. And then there's this like partition to Culver City and there's nobody, there's nobody. So just like with children, children will push boundaries, see what they can get away with. The homeless know that they can get away with it. But a lot of them really, it is about mental health. It's not about just getting them off the streets. This is a huge issue and we're allowing homeless criminals to continue to get away with too much. And when regular tax paying American citizens are trying to work and make their way, those are the ones who get hurt. You know, uh, I think Andrew Breitbart was the one that woke us up to the fact that uh, that um, culture is down or politics is is downhill uh, from uh, from uh, culture. You know, the politics is derives from the culture. So speaking of culture, we have a tremendous cultural phenomenon going on. Let, let's go, Brandon. <laughs> um, and it's it's really unbelievable. I mean, started off very vulgar, then by accident it turned into let's go, Brandon. But what what's your insight into that whole cultural phenomenon? Oh my gosh. First of all, it's a gift. It's a gift. Okay. I literally just wore my Let's Go Brandon shirt today to Starbucks. Um, it's twofold, right? Because it, it, it symbolizes two things. First of all, we're all very, very frustrated at this current administration. And we had to deal with the Trump hate for many years and all the songs of, you know, F Donald Trump and then Trump is a this and Trump is a that. And, you know, so we the, the 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 sports arenas had this outlet before sports games they started this trend and then this journalist i don't know what she was thinking but literally brandon from nascar won his race it's clearly behind her f joe biden no doubt but she has the goal to say let's go brandon so now every time we say that it's an F you to the current administration and it's F you to the media. And that's why it's taken off and it's all over the world and it's really big in Australia. Well, Daniela, let me tell you, it's been an absolute pleasure to have you on our show. Uh, we, we now have named our show JRA Loudspeaker and <laughs> you are certainly a, a, a passionate and loud speaking and thoughtful person and we're glad that we were able to have a full uninter uninterrupted hour with you and thank you for letting our audience get to know you a little bit my pleasure i'm happy to come back anytime and we're happy to have you thank you so ladies and gentlemen thank you for being here you know you you we'd love to discuss these issues what can you do to stay informed, get involved and make a difference? Those are things that JRA really takes pride in. Join our conversations. We are trying to schedule live events, but everywhere we go, we're compelled to have people wear masks. So we're really struggling with that. But in the meantime, participate in our social media, get here on JRA loudspeaker, network with other members of guests, get involved, join our alliance, serve on a committee, help us form chapters, become a member, make a tax deductible donation to our 501c3 JR, Jewish Republican Alliance. And if you want information, go to jewishrepublicanalliance.org. So until we meet again, thank you all for being here. Shabbat Shalom, everyone, and have a great weekend. We will see you soon. Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat Shalom, everyone. <laughs>